Welcome to the Thundercast, your martial athletics podcast produced by the fans, for the fans, with your hosts, Russ Livingood and KD Hudnall. We're bringing you the thundering word on the thundering herd each and every week. So keep it right here. The Thundercast is on the loose. Thanks for downloading another episode of the Thundercast. Follow us on Twitter, Thundercast underscore pod. And over on Facebook, give the page a like over there. Head to YouTube and subscribe to the Thundercast YouTube channel so you don't miss any episodes of the Thundercast via video format. And don't miss any episodes of Inside the Thunder because those are always really entertaining. I got one of those coming up uh, that'll be coming out next week. Got Trying to get a few more lined up to get back on track. It's been a little tough over the past uh, month or so trying to lock folks down. But believe me, I'm working really hard to get that going. Russ, we've got a really, really, really information-packed episode this week. The Breakdown Series is going to continue. This week we're talking about wide receivers and tight ends. Uh, The wide receiving core as a whole, but we're breaking it down a little bit by wide receiver and tight ends. You got us five things, and we're going to go around the herd a little bit like we always do. So let's get right into it since we've got so much to cover Let's get a quick word from our sponsors at 304carwreck.com. Okay, man, there is so much to cover. We need to get right into this episode because they've been running long and there is so much good info between these wide receivers and tight ends to talk about this week that we just need to get rolling. So give me five things every Herd fan needs to know this week. All right, five things every Herd fan needs to know this week. As always, brought to you by IgniteLink, the Tri-State's premier IT management team. Number one, Cornelius Jackson promoted to associate head coach for men's basketball. Yeah, I think this is really cool, man, and one I really didn't pay attention to. It just seems like the type of thing that kind of would have happened already, but I tweeted that it's always (laughs) great to see our own climb the ladder, and and when they can climb the ladder, just get a little extra – Added to the uh, the title here, at home, it feels really good. Corny Jackson has been doing such a great job since he got here. God, I don't even know how many years it's been now since he's been on staff, but it's it, he does such a great job, and I think this just is really, really deserved. Yeah, it's a natural progression, and he is about as – Heard family as it gets, you know, played here, local kid uh, for the state, you know, and then played here, then came to coach here under Dan and uh, done a great job. And just the same as with uh, women's basketball, we just had an elevation to associate head coach over there. These titles, uh, they don't go unnoticed by those that know. Some Mm -hmm. people may overlook them or whatever, but you see it a lot in college football, you know, um, coach Huff was an associate head coach before he came here. It's it's almost like a preparation to get someone up to that head coaching level. Um, let them do a little bit more, uh, be more involved with things. But um, great to see it. Great guy. Glad he's on our side. Yeah, before you go to number two real quick, the only thing I want to mention just on a general basketball note is that we've seen a few offers go out mm-hmm. over the past week or two. Uh, there's no really no really fire to this smoke. It's just something that you know we're paying attention to. So for folks that are big basketball fans, uh, there there are some moves that are trying to be made for the future moving you know 2024 and beyond. So just something to uh, be aware of. But other than that, this is just a congratulatory thing for coach Jackson. Yeah. Number 2, Marshall Football Day at Great American Ballpark. Go see the Reds. Go Reds and uh be there with a lot of Marshall fans. The team coach Huff is throwing out the first pitch. That'll be this Sunday, uh July 16th. So get your tickets through Herd Zone, not through the Reds, uh because all of that money will go directly to the football team. Awesome. Yeah. The long-standing relationship between the Reds and the Herd continues. I know we've got really close relationship with that team, of course, that city. I mean, how many Herd fans are also Reds fans? Uh, you got, you're looking at two of them right here if you're watching this episode. And um, that's always just a cool day. So you can go to the ballpark, you can watch the Reds, you get to rock some Kelly Green inside uh, Great American Ballpark. There's going to be a giveaway too, if I'm not mistaken. Are they giving away a bat or something like that? I'm not. Yeah. I can't remember what it is, but um, I just love that, man. I wish we lived closer so that we could take part in something like that. But 
uh, that'll be a cool event nonetheless. I didn't want to bring up the the bat because it's Marty Brenneman signed and uh, Marty and I have a uh, longstanding feud. Uh, but, uh, anyway, I hope to be there if I'm not in the hospital or dead. I've been uh, deathly sick now for about five, six days. So uh, if I can make it, I will be there. It's always a great time. And i I would love nothing more than to go see my Reds with a bunch of herd fans. Yeah. But those sections are uh, 530, 531, 532. Uh, you'll be sitting with herd fans uh, and the herd football team. Coach Huff, get the tickets again through herdzone.com or 1 800 the herd because your $25 ticket, all the proceeds go directly to the football team. Awesome. Number three, big green event at Country Boy Brewing. This is coming up in Lexington, actually their Georgiatown location, um, the 20th. So Thursday, the 20th, uh, 6 to 8 p.m., uh, get uh, RSVP. You have to do that by the 14th through the big green office. But if you are in that area or want to drive over for that event, get a little tour of the brewery and things like that. And, uh, enjoy a night out with the big green. Yeah, dude, this one came across the timeline yesterday, and I thought, now this one's going to be pretty cool. Because you would like to think there might be some of that really sweet country boy slash herd gear available there. I don't know yeah. that, but, you know, those hats went on sale, and they were gone like lickety split, gone. Yeah. And we haven't seen them back on the in a, for av available for purchase since that initial launch. So this seems like the type of great event to get some of that stuff in person before maybe they release it, you know, online to the general public to buy again. But other than that, you get to go to the brewery tour, tour the brewery, which I've toured breweries in the past. And that's just fun. It's just cool. And uh, to, again, be able to support the herd, get out there, do to go to a different venue and show your herd pride and uh, support one of our partners in Country Boy Brewing, which, I mean, not our partners on the Thundercast. Although, not if, you're yet. if you're listening, guys, we would love to talk to you about doing something uh, because football season's coming up and, I don't know, tailgates and beer and, and football and, and, well, this world we live in, live tailgate shows go pretty hand in hand these days. So if anybody from Country Boy's listening, We'd like to talk to you. Well, I'm sure we could get together on something that, that's mutually beneficial to everybody. But still, RSVP to this Big Green event. Support the Big Green. Obviously going to have an opportunity to uh, join and RSVP, I would imagine, immediately. If you're like, this is the event I've been waiting on. This is getting me off the fence. Call them, sign up, and then RSVP. Get your butt to Georgetown, Kentucky, and have a great evening at Country Boy Brewing. Number four, we finally have uh, a uh, track and field coach, and that is uh, Keith Roberts, and that was just named yesterday, I think it was. Yeah. So welcome to the Herd family, Keith Roberts. Yeah, I know there have been some folks that have been wondering about this, who's going to lead the program, and he's not just called uh, um, head coach. It's like director of track and field because it's more than one team. It's four teams essentially that he's going to be in charge of men's and women's track and field and then men's and I guess, I'm assuming women's cross country. Mm -hmm. So this is more than just a track and field coach uh, comes to us. I believe what was it? Was it Eastern Illinois, Russ? East Illinois. And then uh, before that he was at Pitt. So uh, Christian Spears was definitely familiar with him from there. Yeah, and I, I read the release yesterday. I re, I just read through it really quickly, so I don't have all these details and stats and accolades locked into my head, but I did see that uh, there were several conference champions from his last stop. Uh, the overall team performed quite well in relation to how they performed before he got there. So this is an excellent addition. If you listen to what Christian Spears had to say, he always drives home that it's about the people that we hire here that are championship driven, that have an ideology that is uh, set on taking these programs to another level, to a championship level. We saw some great positive strides made last season. Three conference mm -hmm. champions, several went to NCAA regionals, and we're just looking to kick that up another notch. So, hey, like you said, welcome to the herd. I'm excited for track and field. We really started to pay close attention to those programs. They were just fun to, to 
to pay attention to and keep track of. So let's see if we can keep the momentum rolling, man, and and keep it going. This is an excellent move, in my opinion. And with continuity in mind, they also, in this announcement, uh, have announced that uh, Caleb Bowen uh, will still be uh, men's uh, cross-country coach and that Andrea Deem will stay on as assistant track and field coach. Yeah, that's really nice to know because we saw an immediate, an immediate uptick uh, in uh, cross country, when Caleb Bowen was named head coach, we we saw it like in real time, right? There was a there was an immediate change, and and uh, that's really good to know. I guess I missed that during the release because I was just trying to read the you know the former stop of the new director of track and field. But that's cool. I love a little continuity. That always helps. You don't want a wholesale change when you got a good thing going necessarily and it's good to know that we're going to retain a little continuity while also bringing in somebody you know with with a fresh mindset and new ideas and and ready to hit the ground recruiting as a matter of fact we saw i i we got a new follower over the past couple of days it's somebody that's coming to run track and field here uh so we've seen several of those you know we've talked about several of the uh people that we see like making track and field announcements that was that wasn't something we normally did. We got a follow from uh Braden Ellswick and Marshall University incoming freshman from cross country and track in the class of 2027. So, dang, that's a that's quite a ways away here, but uh he's from Milton, another local kid. You love to see it. All right, our fifth and final thing, uh we have five different uh, All-American scholars from the women's golf uh, team. And that is Abby Bull, Hannah Shrout, Emily McClatchy, Makina Rauch, and Olivia Cochin. Man. Say that again. Uh, what was the what was the accolade? Not all-conference. What was it? All-American scholars. All-American. See, that's what I'm getting at. All-American scholars. Not, not – all conference scholars. This is what we do here, man. Some of these teams are just absolutely smoking it in the classroom. And I never get enough of that. We talk about that all the time. I mean, I love seeing touchdowns and those 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 thrilling three-pointers and home runs and and all of that stuff that happens on our fields of play. But I never get tired of seeing our athletes just dominate in a classroom. Because, again, I never really dominated in the classroom. So I have a lot of respect for our athletes that are able to compete at a high level and then compete at a high level in the classroom. It's just so freaking awesome, man. I love it. Yeah, the balance of uh, and time management that, that it takes to do all this stuff as a Division One athlete and their schedule, not just the – games or meets or matches that they have but you know the workouts the the different stuff and then they work in time to do their studying the all the stuff that they do think about when you have to take tests and you're preparing for this and you're just a student well you just study and you go and you take the test but what happens when you're at an away event leading up to that you know you've got travel time flights, bus rides, and stuff like that, it's hard to do. And yep. we continue to beat the drum on this show about all the good academic achievements that our athletes do. And it, it is really impressive. And, KD, I'm going to use your word. It is a differentiator. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're, we're not one of those uh, programs, athletic departments, that just care about the on-field, on-court, on-track activities we care about what goes on in the classroom we have great student athletes here and i think the program as a whole shows that it's not just one particular team it's all kinds of teams we've been talking about this stuff we just talked about swim and dive last week here we're talking about uh golf well it's it's you have to do that right it, it, it makes sense to do that because so many of these athletes are going to go on to be professionals in the working world not in the athletic arena and if they have a great experience at Marshall and they perform well in the classroom they go on and get that great job and and set the life that they want for themselves 
there's a certain amount of appreciation that always comes back to Marshall be, for putting that foundation in place. And that's how you build an athletic department moving forward, because you would hope that those athletes and alums like me and you have such a great experience that you want to give back to your university, uh, both maybe just the general endowment and also the athletic funds to push things forward and, and make things grow. So it can't just be about, um, how you play on the field. It also has to be about what you accomplish in the classroom because that's how you, you know, successfully grow decades down the road. This is a decade, two decade, three decade long investment, right? So I'm always happy to see this stuff, man. What a great five things this week, man. What a great one because it, we have so much to talk about. I always get jazzed up when we get to do five great things. They're not always great. Sometimes they're ho-hum, and sometimes they're just kind of a bummer. But this week, it was five awesome ones, and that's going to push us. You know, We're going to get into Around the Herd right here, and then we're going to finish out with an unbelievable wide receiver and tight end breakdown. Great as, five things. As always, brought to you by Ignite Link. Well, that was awesome. I mean, let's scoot right into the Around the Herd segment and and get moving towards this breakdown because, man, it's it's info pack. I can't say that enough. Big uh, thing, we'll start with baseball, is Patrick Copen just got drafted by the Dodgers. Uh, not signed as a, uh, a free agent, undrafted free agent, got drafted by the Dodgers. Great yeah, for just, our program. Just a week ago, we were talking about, or maybe two weeks ago, we were talking about him getting the invite to the combine mm -hmm. and how that was a great deal. And and mm -hmm. I said, hopefully he gets in front of the right eyes for him. And man, it looked like it happened. You know, several, first of all, massive congratulations to Patrick Copen, right? In-state guy, Parkersburg Catholic High School, then Marshall. Now the LA Dodgers system. But let's also talk about the fact that a myriad of some belt players got drafted just driving home the fact that this league is great. Mm -hmm. I didn't pay attention to how many people got drafted from the Conference USA. I really don't pay close attention to them anymore, you know. But being that we were just in that league, it you want to see comparatively how it went. But there were so many guys that got drafted from the Sun Belt. It was so cool. Uh, but back to Patrick Copen. This is great, man. This is what this herd baseball team needed. This is what caps off what was a really, really rough season. And if you talk about if if you've listened to that interview that that I did with Coach Greg Beals for the Thunder Trust, he didn't shy away from that. He knew it was going to be a rough year because it was a transition year, uh, both new conference wise and new coach wise. Philosophically, there was a lot going on, and we knew that there was going to be you know, a step back taken. And it, and it was a rough year in the wins and losses column. So to have something like this, to have Patrick come out of the, out of the, you know, the dust of what this season was and get drafted really pushes home that we're moving in the right direction. And you can come to Marshall and then you can find a pathway to the MLB. This is so cool. I'm so happy for him, man. This is so freaking awesome we really needed this last little jolt of momentum from this last season to springboard into the next season so god congratulations to patrick copen and herd baseball yeah anytime you have someone drafted uh that uh boosts your program you know eyes on that program you can become a pipeline if you're known as someone that develops these pitchers and uh, catchers and different position players that are going to get drafted. That's, you know, always huge. So good thing for her baseball. And again, you talked about bringing alumni back, you know, if he goes on to have a great career and everything, that's just going to help our program as well. So absolutely it is. Yeah. All right. Uh, over in football, we've got a couple of different things. One, uh, Dalton Tucker has his uh, camp coming up, and that is a uh, week and a half, July the 22nd, down in Sarita Canova at the football field. And that's uh, July 2nd. Registration starts at 8 at the main gate, but it's uh, from 9 to 11, and there will be representatives from every single position at Marshall. So you'll have players down there helping Dalton Tucker out. And biggest thing about this, free. Free. Yep. Uh, little ty little typo there. While you were giving the date, it's July 22nd, not July 2nd, but that's okay. I know. Did folks, I say 2nd? Yeah. I know folks 
know I'm what high you meant. Rub- <laughs> man. I-, <laughs> I know folks know what you meant. Look on the on the graphic that he put out. If you're not following Dalton, you can follow Dalton on Twitter and and uh, he put the graphic out. I'm sure he's on Instagram and well put the graphic out. So it's got all the information right there on the graphic. There's a walk up registration, like you said. There's going to be reps from all the herd. Uh, position groups there it's completely free the first 100 campers to show up get a free t-shirt all that kind of thing it's like the third year in a row he's done this last year i remember we talked about it and it went really well i was excited to see that this graphic came out and that he's doing it again this has just turned into one of those super cool traditions of summer and you know dalton's a senior we're wishing big things for him but uh no matter what happens if this is something that continues it's just going to be like even cooler right because it's one thing to do it when you're 20 minutes down the road in huntington it's a whole nother thing to do it when you know, you're it's no longer necessarily quote unquote convenient to do and i don't want to put the cart before the horse because we want people to show up for this camp on july 22nd 9 to 11 a.m at ck's field but this is a great opportunity for youngsters to get out there and learn from their guys that they undoubtedly look up to on Saturdays. I mean, we talked about this last year. Could you imagine being nine years old, 10 years old, and being able to go to a free football camp with these giants, these literal giants that you look up to on Saturdays in the fall? I mean, you get to see them without that helmet on. You're getting one-on-one instruction with these guys. How cool is that, man? It's just so cool from a from a kid's standpoint, not to mention you're going to get a little football knowledge along the way. Yeah, and from the other perspective, as a fan, it warms my heart to see these players giving back and doing this stuff. They do a lot of community service, but things like this, they're taking time out of their busy schedules that we just talked about, and they're going down for a free uh, football camp, and that does nothing but solidify these kids are going to grow up and say, man, I I remember when uh, Marshall came down and did this camp for free and everything. They're going to want to go to the games. It's just a great thing to do for the community to give back, but also to help build those bonds as well. Yeah, we we just recruit the right kids, man. We do. We And when they get here, by and large, they just fall in love with Huntington and the surrounding area, Cerrito, Canova, Barbersville, you know, Milton, the whole area. They just fall in love with it, and they want to be connected to it, and I love that. I absolutely love that. So please turn out. Make them have to go, holy crap, what are we going to do with all these people? Because so many kids showed up. Let, let's let's really pack the field for Dalton and this herd team as they put on this free camp in, a, in about a week and a half. Also, we got in football a commitment from uh, quarterback Ja'Kai Long, Gerald Long, wide receiver for Marshall back in the day, his son, and uh, three-star quarterback has recently transferred when they moved here, uh, transferred down to Hurricane. So people in the area will have a chance to see him play before he comes to Marshall. Yeah, and this was a big deal because people were excited about uh, the prospect that uh, he may commit to Marshall. He had a a fairly decent-sized list of offers, but I got the the sneaking feeling that after, you know, he camped, I think he camped or visited or something and, and really got to see what we were all about. And, of course, you know, the blood the bloodline was there and if you're a player for the herd in the 90s <laughs> i'm sure you know you grow up talking about the domination the wins how special it is how there's nothing like it and so you get that in home recruiting like daily uh but they moved from ohio where uh jakai was a really high performer i i, I can't remember the exact um stat but it was either he led his team to the state finals and they lost or the state semifinals and they lost something like an 11 and 2 record last year transfer to hurricane where you got to expect he's going to compete for the quarterback one spot you know with one year to play otherwise why do you go to hurricane but friday night lights guys if you want to make the short trip to hurricane and catch a game and get eyes on this guy like in real time You'll be able to do that. And I don't know Hurricanes football schedule. Hell, they might end up playing Huntington High or Spring Valley or Cabell Midland in an away game. So you might not even have to drive, wow, all the way to Hurricane to catch a game. Uh, I would I would recommend that you get out and watch some of these games because Marshall has eyes on several of these local kids in these high schools. So 
this is a big time get. I'm going to say this looks like uh, making that quarterback room even stronger. Welcome to the herd, Jakai Long. Yeah, and uh, I have a uh, little bit of history uh, with with Gerald. Nothing that you know we're friends or anything like that. But I broke my thumb during basketball my senior year of high school, and he was in the waiting room both times that I went. One to get the cast put on, and two to get it taken off. And we talk martial sports and things like that. And uh, who is for all intents and purposes, uh, a brother of mine, uh, Todd Dillon, who I've shouted out on this show before, and he listens every now and then, grew up with Gerald down in southern West Virginia and Gary. So uh, just great family and good to have Ja'Kai on board with that family as well. And I just I love that we continue – we are continuing this trend of – you know, second generation herd players, right? And that's just so cool to me. The roster is growing more. This is like the fourth that I can think of right off the top of my head that is either on the roster currently or is set to be on the roster by next season. Hopefully we see more. I mean, I love that. Keeping mm -hmm. the herd family in the herd family is great for me, especially guys that are dominating at, at, at the high school level. This is great, man. I love it. What else we got? That's all I've got for around the herd. Uh, I may have missed a couple of things here and there. If you've got anything else, like I said, I have been down for the count for a few days. I've been jotting down notes as I can, but uh, if you don't have anything else, I got it's one. Be great. Okay, I got one. I got one because uh, I saw this uh, on uh, Instagram yesterday. So I just want to shout it out real quick. It's it's uh, about the herd swim and dive team. They named their captains for twenty the twenty three twenty four season. We got a quartet. Of, of captains for the uh, swim and dive team. Paige Banton, Madeline Hart, Esther Laban, and Grace Kelsheimer will be your captains for herd swim and dive in the 2023-2024 season. And I'm going to say something. I, I keep seeing some graphics from time to time that uh, they have some of the coolest martial stuff out there. We talked about those jerseys before, but they've I've seen them being wrapped in some really sweet martial towels. So, hey, herd swim and dive, if you got any extra of those laying around, Send them this way because I'd like to be uh, able to dry myself off with uh, a nice big Marshall towel. It's pretty sweet. It's the script Marshall that yeah, uh, is similar to the basketball. So uh, just one last note there before we get into the breakdown series. All right, well, let's do it. All right. The breakdown series continues this week. We told you last week. When we covered the secondary that we were going to be breaking down the wide receivers and tight ends. And man, there is a lot of information because there was the, uh, of the position groups without, without really diving into it. This has got to be the group that had the most movement portal in portal out recruiting, like everything so far uh, easily so far that we've talked about. So let's get into it. Uh, this group is coached by Joe Von Bonite. And Derek Shea, tight ends coach Derek Shea. Uh, Phil still ranks us tied for fifth in the Sun Belt as a receiving core. That's wide receivers and tight ends combined with Southern Miss and Arkansas State. There is nobody listed on the preseason All-SBC team. Uh, currently on the roster, which we know is... Uh, slightly inaccurate, and the reason I know it is slightly inaccurate is because right now, currently, there's only six tight ends and 12 wide receivers listed. Dude, I counted nine tight ends through everything mm -hmm. that I was able to do. So we know that number is at least, what, 21, but currently on the roster, we're showing 18. Still waiting to get that roster update. We know it'll come closer and closer. So take that with a grain of salt. Uh, some guys we know for sure that are on campus that aren't um, listed on the roster. So, kicking things off, uh, a little bit of a combination here. Those that have exhausted eligibility from last season, wide receiver Stone Scarcelli, tight end Devin Miller, and tight end Stacy Stacy Marshall Jr. That's really it as far as an eligibility exhaustion standpoint. Now, as once you get into the transfer portal, there's a lot of movement there, especially in the portal out from a wide receiver standpoint, of course, famously out Corey Gamage goes to UCF after a couple of other stints. Um, Corey was number one for the herd in 2022 in receptions, yards, and touchdowns. So 
fairly big loss. Well, actually a really big loss from a statistical standpoint from 2022. Shadida Med hits the portal, goes to in-conference foe Texas State. He was tied for fifth in receptions last year with Kalen Laburn, and he was number seven in yards with 150. E.J. Horton hits the portal, ends up at West Virginia after a quick stint at Colorado. He was tied for eighth in receptions last year with Jaden Harrison, also number five in yards with 186. Both he and Shadid Ahmed had one receiving touchdown each. And then also hitting the portal, a couple of younger guys, Caden Bertie and Zion Odoms, no receiving stats in 2022. So that's, what's that, one, two, three, four, five guys out that I could find. Portal in, a couple of guys we've talked about heavily already this year, and we haven't even done the breakdown yet. Demarcus Harris comes over from the University of Kentucky. He was a six foot one, 190-pound junior. And Mason Pierce from McNeese State, the 5'7", 160-pound junior, uh, all Southland second team uh, wide receiver and an all-conference special teams performer. Tight ends, no tight ends in the portal out. Portal in, there were a trio. Luke Soto, who we've talked about. I believe you told the story last week about uh, how they had his height wrong. (laughs) We listed him at 6'4", and he uh, made the comment that he's uh, not 6'4". So what did you think? I think you said he was closer to 6'6", or was 6'6". He's a legit 6'6", and uh, his weight was uh, listed wrong on there as well. He's not extravagantly uh, heavier than what's listed, but he is bigger and heavier than what's listed on here. And he is an athlete. He's a specimen. Okay. So Luke Soto listed at 6'4", easily 6'6", a legit 6'6", according to Russ Living Good. Uh, roster weight says 260 if he's a little bit heavier than, let's say, 270. We don't want to go over overboard with it, but we don't know for sure because the roster is not Incredibly accurate right now. Graduate transfer from UTEP. Uh, Chris Motillo comes over from USF. Another six foot six tight end, uh, 258 pounds listed on the herd zone roster. Comes over as a senior. Cade Conley, if you'll recall, comes over from Central Michigan. Younger guy, red shirt sophomore, six foot four, 242. He actually had some stats with uh, Central Michigan as far as the receiving game goes. I think it was like 11 for maybe a buck 30 or something like that. But he was an all Mac, acad- an academic all Mac performer. Incoming freshman, just one in the class so far. Tight end. Well, want to be so far. Uh, tight end Tracy Stevens, six foot five, two hundred and forty pounds, out of the state of South Carolina. All right. Well, let's talk about some projected starters now that we've got all the movement out of the way. Let's talk about wide receivers first. Then we'll go into tight ends, and then we'll do uh, weaknesses and strengths for both individual units in our eyes. And then we'll ask you those big four questions for both units as well. Projected starters, Russ, here's what I did. I did four guys because th- this is incredibly hard because you don't know how what, what kind of set you're going to line up in, right? right. I mean, you're going to line up with two, three, four, five wide outs. You're going to r- line up with two, three, four tight end. I mean, who knows? How run yeah. heavy are you going to be? Who knows? And it's not going to be the same throughout the game. You're not right. sticking with a certain package and staying with it. So. No, so this is really a, I don't know. I, you just I could have listed them just all together. But yeah. uh, projected starters, I'm going to go – with Charles Montgomery right off the bat, sophomore, five foot 11, 180. Again, these are take these heights and weights with a grain of salt. We're not sure. Uh, Charles was number two in receptions for the herd last year with 36 and number two in yards with 402. Let's go with a senior. How about Talit Keaton? Uh, number three in receptions with 24 and number three in yards with 226 in only nine games because of a shortened injury, a shortened season due to injury in 2022. Really excited about having to leak back fully healthy and rip roaring and ready to go. As a matter of fact, I saw the herd uh, football or uh, Twitter account put out that gift the other day, and it was him from his freshman year say, who is this player when he was still wearing number nine when he took that punt back 
against VMI. So you ain't fooling me, Herd Football. We know who that is. Well, it also had his name on the back of the jersey. <laughs> yeah, not, not a lot of mystery there. Um, but Talik listed at six foot one eighty eight. Let's go with Demarcus Harris, the transfer from University of Kentucky, six foot one one eighty five. Four receptions for 90 yards and 12 games for Kentucky in 2022. But, again, that familiar, familiarity with Coach Bonite, you got to think is going to pay a little bit of dividend this year. And then a guy that we were really excited about last year, Russ, uh, ended up using his red shirt last year. That was last year transfer from Florida State. Wide receiver Brian Robinson. We were really excited about him, if I'm not mistaken. I think you named him as your breakout player last year based on what we saw in the spring. Six foot two, 204, uh, just four games to retain that red shirt. Had one reception in 2022, but man, this could be the year that he breaks out in a big way. Um, let's talk about some guys that are undoubtedly going to be heavy contributors and in that rotation for this herd wide receiver core. Of course, played big role last year. Six foot, 201 pound senior Caleb McMillan, number seven in receptions with 13, number four in yards with 198 and a touchdown through the air last year. Uh, Jaden Harrison, the five foot 11, 190 pounder, number eight in receptions with 12, number nine in yards with 95 and a touchdown through the air. Of course, Jaden plays his biggest role in special teams, but still is a threat in the receiving game. A couple of guys that uh, are looking to break out for the herd, but I think they're going to have a lot of opportunity to do so in the in the rotation. That's Caleb Coombs, Huff's first ever recruit. Uh, he came, I think he was actually re- um, committed to Alabama and came over with Huff when Huff took the job, five foot 11, 188 pounds, number 11 in receptions last year, just three and number 13 in yards with 20. But Caleb is a guy who reminds me a lot of Charles Montgomery. They're just sneaky athletic and can really burn you if they get a shot. So let's see if Caleb has the opportunity to make some noise like Charles Montgomery did last year. And then finally, uh, in my top eight, I don't want to call him the top eight, but in the first eight, Mason Pierce, right? The transfer that we're really excited about, 5'7", 160. He had 40 receptions for 512 yards and a couple of touchdowns in 11 games in 2022 at McNeese. Trio of fellas, Russ, looking to making make an impact this year, trying to get uh, work their way up that roster, that depth chart, and see if they can get some game action and make the most of it, of course. First one on the list, six foot, one hundred and sixty-eight pound red shirt freshman, legacy player, Cam Pedro. Uh, we were really excited when Cam decided to commit uh, to, you know, be one of those legacy players, right? Famously, the son of legendary herd running back Glenn Pedro from the early '90s. Um, if you guys, you younger fans, don't know the name. Glenn Pedro. You can go on YouTube. You can watch that 92 national championship game. You can watch some of those early 90s uh, Marshall games in their entirety. And you can go, wow, we had some dogs back then. And Glenn was one of those guys. One of the most underrated, underappreciated players. uh, I feel like uh, because he was here at the same time as Chris Parker, a lot of his accomplishments, achievements go under the radar. 31, I think, touchdowns. Uh, you know, he's got numbers up there that uh, list him on the top 10 all time. Yeah. And he's, he's a great dude. I just happened to have a chance to sit down with him during that 92 reunion show that we recorded last year. But uh, he also happened to tell us that Cam is a little heavier than what's here on the roster, which I'm sure a lot of these red shirt yeah. freshmen are. Well, I expect a lot of these guys across the entire roster are. So when we have, you know, the official, I, I know they always do the the media thing to where they get everything, they take their new profile picture, they do that, they get yeah. heights and weights, and, and then everything gets updated. And I expect a lot of these guys to be a little taller and a little heavier just from, I mean, damn, everybody grows, especially these youngsters. But yeah. uh, really excited about uh, Cam and his opportunities this year to see if he can get cracked on the field there and 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 make the most of his opportunities um a couple of other guys that are looking to make an impact six foot three 182 red shirt freshman wide receiver antonio robinson and six foot 181 pound red shirt freshman 
Sean Reese. R Russ, do you have any, before without getting into strengths and weaknesses, do you just have any general thoughts really quick on wide receivers before we talk about the tight ends? Yeah, I have not seen a position group that has a lot of familiar faces that seems like it will be totally new more than this coming in. It's just um, Talit Keaton's been here for several years, but it seems like it's new because he was uh, on the shelf so long last year. Um, we also had the issues in a passing game last year, and I feel like this is people that we saw last year. I feel like it's going to be so much different this year. So that's just the initial knee-jerk reaction that you're going to see a lot of familiar faces, but because some of them have left and we hope to have a revamped passing game, I think that this is just going to look so different than last year with, and I with would a lot of the agree. same players. I would have to agree. It does feel weird to see so many familiar names, but yet have the position group as a whole feel relatively brand new yeah, you know Jaden, Jaden Harrison's been here three years I think Talik's been here forever uh, and McMillan's been here forever so there's a trio of guys you know that, that have been here three plus years mm -hmm. but there's still some of those youngsters that made some noise last year and I th I'm with you I think we'll see a lot of uh a lot of new in the way that um Cam Fancher is now a year older. He's a more progressed quarterback. I mean, you would like to think. We haven't really seen him. You know, everything's kind of close to the vest, but still, the development has to be there. I mean, he was, a, you know, working on his first through seventh starts of his career. He's bound to be more comfortable. Hell, he was more comfortable at the end of the season than in the middle of the season last yeah. year anyway. So that goes without saying. And then, of course, the underlying weapon that is Rasheen Ali out of the backfield, you would have to think open things up tremendously because now linebackers have to respect Ali out of the backfield. You can't really cheat to, you know, get into a zone, so to speak, or you have to play more straight up and, and respect everybody from a receiving standpoint. I think we'll see a little bit of flexibility here that we may not have necessarily had last year. And yeah. I'm kind of here for it. Uh, let's talk about some of these tight ends. Now, look, I only did two projected starters, but again, this is from a receiving standpoint. So, you know, if we're going run heavy, you're going to have those guys that block better in the game, right? That's just how it's going to be. But I'm looking at things from a receiving standpoint because we're talking about a receiving core. So let's start with Toby Payne, the sophomore, six foot four, two thirty five. Couple of receptions last year for twenty seven yards, and a touchdown in ten games for the herd. He played quite a bit at tight end. It wasn't just some like special team stuff. He played and lined up at tight end. So um, there is a there is a relatively decent amount of in game experience from the tight end position there for Toby, and then a guy that I'm projecting to have a pretty big year that we were also really excited about. You particularly were excited about this guy, and he got dinged up and was un unable to really see the field much, if at all, in 2022. And that's six foot five, 230 pound red shirt freshman Sean Salas. I know you were really happy about that commitment. We we uh, we kind of stole him away from UConn late in the process. And the athleticism uh, and the and the uh, gameplay for you really popped off the charts last year, and, and you were really excited to think he would be an impact freshman. But he got dinged up and was unable to do that. So this is a guy I think has a possibility to do something really special from a receiving standpoint um, in the, from the tight end position for the herd in 2023. Now, look, there is no way I'm going to talk about heavy contributors and the looking to make an impact category. We're putting all these guys together because by and large, it's uh, you know a couple of guys that were on the roster last year, and then it's a bunch of transfers. So we have really no idea what we have in a herd uniform, right? Uh, but let's run down him here. From a transfer from FAU a year ago, six foot five, two hundred forty-four pound uh, Ramad Smith will be a sophomore. Then we get into the guys kind of that we got this year. Actually, Marcus Velez was on the roster last year, going to be a redshirt sophomore or a redshirt junior. I've, in 2022, he was showing as a redshirt sophomore. In 20, I'm sorry, 2021, he was showing as a redshirt sophomore. 2022, he was showing as a redshirt sophomore. I'm not really sure of the class standing. Anyway, six foot five, 258 pound Marcus Velez. Now it's the guys that are coming in this year, either through transfer, transfer or 
incoming freshman. And we mentioned Luke Soto earlier, six foot five, six foot six, legit. Six, We're six. calling it 270 ish. Comes over from UTEP. He's a senior. Chris Motillo comes over from USF, another six foot six, 258, 260 pounder, also a senior. Cade Conley, we mentioned earlier, redshirt sophomore from comes over from Central Michigan, six foot four, two hundred and forty pounds. Tracy Stevens, the incoming freshman, six foot five, two forty. I missed one guy who was on the roster last year, and that's Bo Blankenship. He'll be a redshirt freshman, six foot four, two hundred and thirty-two pounds. This position group for me, Russ, before I get your take on it overall, is probably the biggest. I don't know what we're doing with the position right now just because there's so much new here uh, Marshall has been really effective at utilizing the tight end for such a long time we've had such a great lineage of great tight ends both blocking and receiving this is the first time in a long time to where I'm not sure exactly what the tight end is going to do in this Clint Trickett offense doesn't mean I'm worried about it it just means I'm really not sure what I'm looking at here, but uh, I'm excited nonetheless. I'm positive about it. It's just a question mark for me as far as how we're going to utilize these guys. What's your thoughts on tight ends? Biggest mystery uh, around when I look at this, and you know, the, there was a point over this off season where we already had like five tight ends, and then we got a tight end transfer out of the portal, and. I'm like, oh, okay, so there's a sixth tight end. And then two days later, you would get another transfer. <laughs> and then again, within yeah. a couple of weeks, and I'm like, come on, man, what's going on? Uh, I have uh, posited that possibly there's going to be a position change or, or something, or I don't know. I mean, I don't have any inside info on that. It just seems like it would be a good possibility, you know? Well, when the hell have you carried nine? Throughout an entire year. I, that just seems like an exceedingly high number for tight ends. Yeah. And like, okay, yeah, linemen, yes, you need more than nine. I get that. Yeah. There are certain position groups where nine is, like, low. But tight end, to me, seems like that's a big number for tight ends. It seems yeah. like uh, you're right. You you would either be expecting there to be a late entrant into the transfer portal if things don't go right. And remember, Huff said graduate guys can go – right up and through or before the first game. And I'm not speculating that's what's going to happen. I'm just saying there's a lot of tight ends on the roster and there's only so many that you can put on the field. So something always has to give. I don't want any of these guys to leave. I'm not trying to run any of them out of town. I'm just saying, man, that's a lot. I don't, I'm, that's why I'm so, you know, intrigued about how they'll be utilized. So if you've got three or four guys that just absolutely are bulldozers and road graders, you're going to utilize those for this run game. And Rasheen Ali and A.J. Turner and all these other guys that we'll talk about in a couple of weeks, if you've got guys that are great in pass protection, then you're going to utilize those guys as well. Uh, and if you've got guys that can receive, you're going to utilize those as well. So maybe we've just got guys that are really, really good at one or two things, and and we've got a couple of guys that are just the total package, but – I don't know. I'm just intrigued. So let's go into the strengths and weaknesses portion. Let's start with wide receivers, Russ. Give me what you think, what you perceive to be strengths for the wide receiver core heading into the 2023 season. Uh, speed overall. I think that we've got some fast players. Um, I think that uh, that is my number one is we're going to have speed Uh I've I've talked to I'm blue in the face about and not from the Robitussin, but uh, Mason Pierce, you know, and the the speediness that he brings over. But Charles Montgomery was fast. You can see when he had those breakout seventy six yarders, things like that. He's got the ability to take it to the house at any point. So it's all about that speed and how we can utilize it. And I think that we can stretch the field with that speed. Well, not shockingly, my number one overall strength also is I think we just have speed to burn, right? And that's exactly what I wrote down. You look at a healthy Talit Keaton who uh, has made plays for you both in the receiving game. Go back to that game, the season opener a couple of years ago against Navy. He makes that big 43-yarder. 
you know, and he's had other big plays, but these are exciting plays because it's not a 43 yard catch and you're knocked out of bounds. It's a short catch and a run and you make some moves and you get some yards after contact. That's the type of stuff I'm talking about, right? So a healthy Talit Keaton, who you know is a is a burner. Jaden Harrison is an absolute burner. Charles Montgomery, who you mentioned, is a burner. And Mason Pierce, who you also mentioned. So you look at four guys right there. So if you want to go with an absolute ridiculous speed package on the field, you can put four wide out there with, with four absolute burners and try to make something happen. Uh, but that it doesn't just stop with those four guys, right. right? That's just four guys I wrote down. Every you don't make it to this level and compete at this level, and especially compete in an offense like Charles Huff and Clint Trickett are building, and Bo Knight is building without being able to run. Right? You've got to be elusive. You've got to have the moves. You've got to have the breakaway speed, and you've got to have the ball skills to go up and make plays. Now, what is our pass game going to look like? Are we going to rely on that intermediate game more this year as opposed to the long stretch the field routes? I mean, of course, you're always going to have the stretch the field route, but who knows what we're going to look. We'll, we'll know what that looks like when we trot out week one or probably more effectively week two. Uh, what's this herd offense going to be focused on? You're not going to give anything away in your opener. I mean, why would you? You know, we talk about that every year. So we'll have a more accurate depiction of what this offense really looks like when you get into the East Carolinas, Virginia Techs, you know, and the conference schedule in the NC States. That's what you want to do. You're not going to give anything away against Albany. That's not going to happen. But speed to burn for me is absolutely the number one overall strength. What's your number two? Number two is I feel like we still have size. Uh, we do not have the, I know Mason Pierce is the exception to this rule to being under six foot, but we do not have a plethora of 5'10 wide receivers and that's it. We still have six foot, six one, uh, even up to six three on the roster. We don't have the six four, six five wide receivers, but we are not undersized in this uh, wide receiver room. Well, my number two overall is or my number two strength is i still think we have overall depth despite those production losses from the portal and that's something that we alluded to earlier to where we still have guys that are have been here for a number of years but it still feels like a relatively new group right it wasn't wholesale changes at the wide receiver core because there's a lot of familiarity there there are a lot of guys that have been around the program for a number of years but i still think depth wise we're looking pretty good. Uh, Charles Montgomery, I feel, is going to just be an absolute weapon this year. I always am excited to see Talit Keaton trot out on the field. I mean, he just brings something that not a lot of guys bring. Uh, I don't know what that is. I can't put my finger on it, but it's just that something that that makes you feel like when he's on the field, good things can happen at any moment. And some of these youngsters, Brian Robinson, that we feel like is going to be a big-time contributor this year, um, Mason Pierce, Harrison, you know, the, it feels like the the overall depth where you, you might be able to um, take an injury, a guy or two missing a game or two here and there. You know, we I'm, I'm not sure we could we could handle, you know, a couple of our <clears throat> guys that we're going to lean on heavily, like going down in week two you know, and, and not seeing him again till week 10. That's obviously going to have a hit on your passing or on your receiving game. But I think overall, you know, we have the, the depth to have some of our guys miss a little bit of time throughout the season, nothing long-term, and still be relatively impactful versus having them all healthy. So that, to me, is, is a definite strength. What do you got for number three? So – People might seem uh, or think that this seems a little weird, but we have a void right now. We don't have a true number one wide receiver. And I think that that is a strength because what's going to happen is friendly competition. It's going to be that rising tide to bring everybody up. I think that there is going to be um, so many different people looking to be that guy, the guy in the wide receiver room, that I feel like it's really going to help that we may have three that although they don't have a hundred receptions like uh, Schuler did, uh, you don't have one guy with 14 uh, touchdowns like Watts did. What you're going to have is three guys 
maybe two, maybe four that are going to be pushing each other to try to fill that void of what's going on. And I, that's just, that's the feeling that I get. I hope that uh, I am right in that, that not having a number one clear number one right now is uh, it plays out that way instead of the other way that it could play out. So I'm going to give you my third strength and then I'm going to use that point and just pivot right into you know, the, the weaknesses side of this, my third overall strength for me is that there's a potential to be more lethal in that mid range game, right? Because of another year of development of Cam Fancher, another year of development of Charles Montgomery, you know, the emergence of uh, potentially Mason Pierce and these guys that make, can make their money in the middle, making moves and making guys miss. Um, and also because of Ali coming out of the backfield, so he has to be taken into account in the receiving game where he's not a wide receiver. No, he's not a tight end. No. So we're not talking about him from a depth chart perspective today, but in the mid range passing game, you have to account for Rasheen Ali. And I think that two years ago, 46 receptions, right. 7.4 per catch. Right. So that is a guy that is going to garner attention from those linebackers, maybe a creeping up safety type of thing. It's going to cause opposing defenses to have to really think about how they're going to cover the herd. If you've got guys that can absolutely slice up and obliterate the middle of the field and you've got an equally dangerous guy that can come out of the backfield and do the same thing, you have to account for him. So I think the potential uh, for our wide receivers to get a leg up because of the benefit of having a guy like Rasheen Ali out of the backfield is a massive strength moving forward. Now, let me pivot into my first weakness, and this is one that you're seeing as a strength, and that is the fact that you say we don't have a quote-unquote wide receiver one. See, I see that as a little bit of a negative because we don't have that guy that defenses go, okay, we have to, we have to take this guy out of the game. Do we have guys that can hurt you? Yeah, all over the field we have guys that can hurt you. But it, it feels like even though Corey Gamage, and this is no slight against him, even though he led the team in receptions, yards, and touchdowns last year, I never really felt like he he would just take over a game. You know, yeah. I never really felt that way. Even though he had all the um, the the physical stature to do it, he had the ability to do it. For whatever reason it was, maybe it was the passing game, maybe it was the quarterback, maybe it was the defensive plate, whatever it was. It, I'm not saying it was just him. I'm just saying it, it didn't feel like we were f – I felt like he's going to go for, you know, 100 yards and 10 catches every game. It just didn't feel that way. And uh, I feel like that's something that I would like to see again. A guy that, you know, you trot out every week and you go, good Lord, this guy's going to kill us no matter what we do from a – you know, the defenses are saying, man, this guy's going to get his yards. He's going to get his catches. We have got to try to minimize that because we can't take it away. Is the guy on the roster? Perhaps. Certainly hope it is. I certainly hope it is. Uh, but also, you know, maybe it's just my weird thinking, but always I, th I think of that wide receiver one guy being that really tall burner outside wide receiver. It doesn't have to be. It could be that inside slot guy that is your wide receiver one that will go for 10, 12 yards a catch like Tommy Schuler, right. rack up those yards, move those chains, continually be a weapon and a thorn in the side of the defense because you can't keep him from moving the chains. But I don't know that we have that dominant wide receiver one right now at this point. Talk to me after week two, week three, and we see how things are looking, and maybe we do, and we just don't know what we have yet, but – uh, to me, until I see it, I feel like that's a little bit of a weakness. I would absolutely love to see Talit Keaton come out and be like, this is my squad this year, this is my room, I'm the guy, right? That would make me feel great because you know how I feel about senior performers having that curtain call year. Mm -hmm. um, but I still need to see it. So who's uh, what's your first uh, weakness? It, and again, it's that same side of the coin, but right now it's the unknown. Yeah, uh, is my my weakness. And, you know, people can pick apart what I'm saying, that one thing is a strength. I said it could be a strength. The other, it is an unknown. So it is a weakness as of right now. 
a lot of the weaknesses that we go over is pure speculation just yeah. because we haven't seen them on the field. Yep. You know, and it does it not just for wide receivers, but any position group that we're talking about. You know, and right now it's an unknown when we're talking about quarterback. It was an unknown last year when we were talking about quarterback. We famously didn't know who it was going to be until a week before the season or maybe two weeks. So the unknown right now of who is going to step up is a weakness for me. And it can coincide with it being a strength because I feel like because there is that void again that these people will push each other and someone or several someones will step into that role. So that's where I'm at on, on my first weakness. I would, I like that. I, I, I mean, I don't like that, but I like that idea is, is, is that it's the unknown is the weakness, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. There are some guys that you are going to expect to perform to a certain level because they've done it in the past but again, this is like we said, this feels like a new unit because several of these guys have not played that much together. It just feels kind of question marky, even though it's positive. I, I, it's such a weird thing to talk about, man. Uh, but for me, you know, I don't know what it is, man. I, I, I always get hung up on the fact that there's not this just towering wide out. Right. And, and, and that doesn't always equate to success, but when we talk about things from the secondary standpoint and you talk about shorter statured guys having to go up and already giving up, you know, four or five inches of height before you make a play on the ball, that's an advantage for the wide receiver. And we mm-hmm. don't really have that. You, we have, Brian Robinson at six foot two. We have Antonio Robinson, the red shirt freshman at six foot three, but everybody else is in that five, 10 to six foot range. While again, not short, but it evens the playing field for most uh, corners and safeties in the league because they're going to be kind of right around that same, you know, measurable. Well, but I had it as a strength because how often do you see, uh, these small wideouts that you know would be in that five seven to five nine range, just because they're a burner and things like that. And we've only got one, yeah, really, you know. And and we don't have several of them that we have to say, well, you know, we're a short wideout team. We when you're talking about five eleven and six foot and six one, I feel like that's still a a good wide receiver unit. You don't have to have the six foot three and and things like that but as we will talk about here when it shifts over to tight end we do have more of that so it's exactly like, so we're we're going to be able to talk about that a little bit different so well here's how you offset that measurable right that six ones which by the way again it's not short. It's anything yeah. over like five ten is tall to me, regardless. So uh, I'm just saying what you have to do is is you don't get that added luxury of an extra two three inches of just height before the ball is snapped over over mm-hmm. a corner or a safety. So how do you make up for that? You play larger than your stature, which I think we have guys that do that. Now that turns into how physical are you when you attack the ball. Right? Do you go up? Can 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 your quarterback count on you to go up and win the majority of those quote unquote 50-50 balls? Right. That's the kind of stuff that we need to see. How aggressive are you going to be within the confines of the rules to go up and ensure that you make that catch? That that you are the one coming down with that ball. You know, how much finesse do you have? How well of a how how well do you run routes? Right. That type of thing. Uh, it, all of that technique type stuff easily outweighs two or three inches that you're that you may be missing in the height category, right? Because some of our most productive wide receivers ever, ever were shorter statured guys, right? I mean, look at it. Just look at it. Go look at the record book. Go look at you know career receptions, career yards, and things like that. Not everybody's Randy Moss, obviously, because if they were, well, he wouldn't be as special as he is because. Everybody would be that way. But also, not everybody's just like a guy you mentioned earlier. Not everybody's Tommy Schuler for crying out loud. Shorter statured guy, but leaves Marshall with like 300 and some plus career receptions. And he ranks in the top 10 in all these statistical categories. He was a great 
wide receiver. I think one day, one day, Tommy Shuler is going to be a Marshall Athletics Hall of Famer. He just is because of what he meant to that era of herd football. So you don't have to be 6'2 plus just to be an impactful wide receiver. You have to have great technique and exploit your potential to be a great, great wide, wide receiver. And I think we got guys that can do that. It's just a matter of, like you said, it's the great unknown right now. Um, do you have another weakness or was that it? I've got one final weakness. And unless you're running an end around or a jet sweep, the wide receiver has to have the ball thrown to him to make an impact. Yep. Uh, you can run routes and spread out the, uh, the offense and still make an impact, but to actually get receptions, have chances for touchdowns, stretch the field, you have to have it thrown to you right now going in from last year, our passing game is not where we would want it to be. And that, is a huge weakness for us. We have got to have a better passing game. And it might not be the – we talked about this a lot. It might not be the quarterback's fault. You know, it could have been the wide receivers not getting open last year. Uh, I don't personally think it was. I think that we had um, – when Cam came in, things started to open up a lot more. Uh, you know, the dynamics that he brought to be able to avoid rushes and, and throw – uh, so I think that it will work itself out. But right now, if you're just looking at paper, passing game is not where it needs to be. That's a liability for the uh, wide receivers. Yeah, that's a good point, man. You know, you a lot of times we put things on wide receivers, and they could run the cleanest, most crisp route of all time. But if your quarterback just misses that wide open, bona fide touchdown pass, is that on the wide out? No, because he did his job. Right. So these are so this is such a two tiered thing or two factor thing that you, you can't pin all these weaknesses. Right. Quote unquote weaknesses on just the wide receivers. They can do their job perfectly and the quarterback can do his job perfectly. But still, you could have a negative outcome because the man in coverage plays his side perfectly. And it's a it's just a you know, bad luck because you make a great play on the ball and it turns into an incomplete pass or even worse, it turns into an interception and everybody did everything right. So uh, I guess the sum for wide receivers for me, really excited about the potential for this group. I don't want anybody to get hung up going, oh God, Katie's just not on it because we don't have five, six, four guys out there. No, that's not it. You know, I just always love that big, tall, wide receiver that just attacks a sideline, can run the route, just make a make a beeline for the end zone and just catch that beautiful long bomb that we all love to see. And I love to see that, but I'd also take any one of our guys doing that, right? And it doesn't have to be down the sideline. It could be right up the seam. It could be a crossing route across the entire field. I don't care if Cam or whoever's throwing the ball can hit him. That's all I really want to see, right? Mm -hmm. So – uh, to sum up, really excited about the potential for this group, uh, both from the guys that are returning that know the herd way, that have been with Huff and, and uh, Coach Bonite for a couple of years. Um, Derek Shea and what he's going to get these guys to do in his first year as tight ends coach, which we're getting ready to talk about. But overall, as a receiving core unit, I'm, I'm optimistic. I'm not even cautiously optimistic. I'm just flat out optimistic. So don't think I'm a hater just because – there's not 10 six foot six guys from a wide receiver standpoint, but there happened to be a buttload of six, five, six, four, and six, six guys in the tight end room. So let's talk about them, Russ. Let's go into strengths uh, for the tight ends. What do you got for your number one strength? Versatility. I mean, if you can't find versatility and having nine different players on your roster in <laughs> that, that room, versatility, you've got speed. Yeah. You've got uh, Payne and Salas uh, that are out there on the, the side that can be matchup nightmares, right? Yeah. You've got the big blockers that you can bring in. Uh, talk about putting a two or even three tight end set on a goal line package where you're bringing in three of those guys that are basically like a just a slightly smaller offensive tackle. You know, yeah, right. uh, you, you've got it. They're right there on the roster you know, and huge and oh yeah, they can catch as well. So if you have to do a slip, uh, slip out, uh, like the Pinkerman touchdown, you know, that we had, 
they're right there. You know, you got all that versatility uh, from the different things that this room brings. And I think that that's a huge strength. Well, let's just talk about just from last year, the biggest touchdown of the year. Devin was, a, was a slip out to the tight end, right? And yeah. it was it was Columbia to Devin Miller in South Bend, Indiana. I mean, it's, that we'll talk about that for decades, decades and decades, right? That's going to go down in the annals of Marshall history as one of the greatest touchdowns of all time. But you're right, versatility is huge. But for me, the since we're talking about receiving, I'm looking at everything first from a receiving standpoint. The receiving tight ends, i.e. who we know are more receiving tight ends, we don't know much about the transfers and and the guys that haven't seen the field that much. There may be more, quote-unquote, receiving tight ends, but the receiving tight ends, Toby Payne, Sean Salas, are like added wide receivers. So if you do go five wide and you got four wide outs and a tight end, it's like – or if you go – yeah, that, that's like a different type of five wide, right? Instead of just going five wide, five wide receivers, you can have four wide receivers and a tight end. I mean, you're, you're talking about versatility, flexibility. Think about this. Three wide receivers, pick your poison. Two, any one of those wide receiving tight ends, pick your poison, and Rasheen Ali. How many freaking targets do you have on the field at any given time? That is options galore right there. So having guys like that, Payne and Salas particularly, be essentially just taller wide receivers lined in tight, and they can and you can line them up, you know, out in the slot or whatever. I think the creativity that that we may see between these minds on this coaching staff, Clint Trickett, Bill Legg, Bo Knight, Derek Shea, and Charles Huff. I mean, dang man, what what could we see here from a X's and O's standpoint? that is heavily predicated on the flexibility of what these tight ends can do and the flexibility of what you have now in the backfield which with Rasheen Ali. The receiving tight ends, I just can't get past. I think this is an amazing opportunity to do something special. Being that they're both younger guys, neither one has really, quote-unquote, broken out. Uh, I'm still excited for the potential here of what some of these formations might look like for the herd, like things that some of these defensive coordinators – aren't expecting to see or don't know how to defend because, hey, we didn't do that last year. There's no film on that last year. So that's my number one strength from a tight end perspective. Uh, What's your number two? Very similar to that. It's a matchup nightmare. Who do you put on Sean Salas at six foot five and currently listed as 232? But he was a stretch the field tight end coming out of high school. He's got the speed. Um he's going to be a tight end that is going to be closer to the sidelines, you know, a a lot. And you don't have to line him up there. Think of where Cody Slate, Cody Slate was all over the field. Right. You know, and um, you've got Toby Payne who, you know, we're in my mind, I keep thinking that he and is, is shorter for some reason. He's listed as six, four. Yeah. Yeah. He's six, four, two twenty eight, And we saw a little glimpse of what he did last year as a, 18 year old true freshman. That's right. And um, it's just a matchup nightmare. And then, oh, let's throw in Luke Soto, who's six foot six, still athletic at six foot six, 260, 265, 270, whatever it is. The guy um, played, or not played, but did rodeo. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to talk rodeo. about that. Competitive yeah. rodeo. And and he's, he's just an athlete, right? So, we have matchup nightmares to where it's not just, hey, let's put the the big tight end out there. Okay, well, we're going to put a a big uh, linebacker on him, or a you know a big defensive end, or whatever. You know that that's that's going to be that guy. You're talking about putting a five eleven to six foot six two even defensive back on these guys. So you're talking about putting a safety, uh, an outside linebacker. Uh, they might not have the speed to stick with these guys. And they've got the added what you were already talking about at wide receiver, which is what I said. We'll get to that. Yep. You've already got that added height and everything. Yep. So that was mine was a matchup nightmare because you bring in somebody fast, you're going to have all the height difference that, that you have. Uh, Salas being six, five, his reach and all that stuff. He might have, 
maybe even five or six inches of height difference there when you're talking about going up for a ball. Yeah. So um, this is why I'm not a hater on the wide receiver core because of this, because there's right. six, four, six, five in a matchup, you know, situation. And I want to toss out a couple of names. You tossed out Cody Slate, which a lot of our, you know, I don't want to call them older fans, but the, you know, the, the newer era, uh, conference USA era, when we first joined po- folks are going to realize that name. But let me toss out a couple of names that, you know, younger fans or newer generation of fans will go, Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. How about Xavier Gaines? That guy was an absolute, uh, nightmare for matchup, uh, a matchup nightmare. And one of the vo- most vastly underutilized players ever at Marshall, mm-hmm. right? And Ryan Juracek, a very, very, very impactful tight end that just seemed to be able to do everything well. These are the type of guys that I feel like these youngsters can really be. Maybe not this year, maybe a glimpse this year, but moving forward, that's the type of guys I feel like that we have in this room. I think I mentioned this name last year. But Gator Hoskins, yeah, that yeah. that guy was open every single play. I don't know how you can get open that often, but he was. <laughs> All the guy did was catch catch touchdowns, and um, he was always open. I mean, it wasn't like he had to. I mean, he was basically just standing there, and you had to throw it to him, and he caught it. That's true. Uh, but that's the kind of player that I think that we have not you know, putting these guys on the spot and say, well, if you're not Gator Hoskins, you're not Cody Slate, you're not Ryan, you're a check. No, not- that's the potential that's yeah. here. I feel yeah. like that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like what did a freshman Ryan, you're a check. What did a fresh, well, Gator wasn't here as a freshman. I don't think, but what did a freshman Cody Slate do? That's what you're saying. With freshman- Gator was, Gator was, oh, was here he? as a freshman. Yeah. Oh. He was, he was one of Doc's uh, first uh, uh, recruits. And he was a quarterback in high school. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So that's what I'm talking about is the potential here. Look, my number two uh, strength for this group, I think the run blocking is going to be absolutely unfreaking real from yeah. these guys. Yeah. Absolutely unreal. And when you talk about an offense that wants to run the ball, we've talked to Huff. We know what he wants to do. Yeah. He wants to run the football and establish a dominant line of scrimmage on both sides of the ball. But if you've got, we've already talked about our offensive line and how great the run blocking was last year. And if you toss in that extra blocker or two blockers, you have to, (laughs) if you have to bring in your jumbo package, Russ, down there on the, on the goal line, how are you going to block all of these guys? And, And then you have the, the absolute just sheer ability for a guy like Rasheen Ali to sniff out the end zone. That's what he does, man. So the, the run blocking here is going to be off the freaking charts for Marshall. This is stuff that's not going to show up in the stat line, but it's going to be so massively impactful. It's not going to be a tight end stat. It's going to be a Rasheen Ali stat. It's going to be an A.J. Turner stat. It's going to be a Cam Fancher stat. That is going to be an, a, a massive part of what this tight end room is going to do this year. And I'm, I tell you what, as far as receiving goes, I'm really excited, for but for the run blocking, I'm like, massively jazzed for what this might be. I mean, the athletes that we talked about, the guys that we – how are you going to bring in a competitive rodeo guy and not think he's just going to toss you around like a like a rag doll? I mean, yeah. come on, man. Come on. What's your uh, next string? Well, my final one is the size that we've talked about. And, I've you know, it's been mentioned several times, but this is the specific one. You've got six four, six six, uh, six four, six five, six five, six five, and then these other guys that are not listed on here. They were all above that six four mark, if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah. You've got size, 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 and that is why I was agreeing so well with your your final one there or your last one that you had. I, I should say of um, uh the run blocking you bring these guys in and again, it's just a slightly smaller offensive tackle that you're putting in there. I goal line package. <laughs> I'm telling you it's well, the third and one, think about that, that yeah. crucial third and one third and two, like you gotta have it. Come on, man. This is going to be some for fans of, of smash mouth. I think at, at certain times in every game you're getting, you're going to get an opportunity to see Marshall go heavy and smash, play a little smash mouth football, play a play here and a play there. That's not what we're going to run. We know that. But there were times last year when we needed that third and two. We needed that third and one. And, uh, you know, it was it was the uh, the strength of labor, just not being able to bring that guy down that would 
get you that third and one, that third and two. But there were some times that we just flat out came up short. We couldn't make it happen. Now, we're not going to go perfect on third and short this year, but I think it's going to be more entertaining to see the impact at the uh, the collision at the line of scrimmage with some of these dudes that just seem like hard-nosed guys, like guys I don't want to come – guys I don't want to piss off and just have them mad at me for no apparent reason. Yeah. So I'm, I'm really excited about that, that little aspect of the game. Uh, now, my third strength was one that you mentioned before, so I'm just going to breeze through it. How are you going to not? Ha- how are you going to have nine tight ends on the roster that and not think you've got unmatched flexibility for certain yeah. packages? Anything you want to do, you've got a tight end or two tight ends that you can plug into that and make it work. So the overall flexibility for me was the third strength because I led from a receiving standpoint. So let's go straight into weaknesses. What is you? Th- what's your number one weakness for this group? How do you fit them all in is the number one for me. And that that's pretty much my only weakness that I have is how do you fit them all in? You've got nine on the roster. I'm assuming multiple, several of these will be playing a lot of special teams. Sure, sure. So, uh, But how do you spread it around and, you know, hopefully we don't lose someone because they think, well, I'm not going to see the field. You know, I want to have them here. So when you've got nine in a tight end room, again, that's the most that I can ever think of that we've had here. Uh, How do you get them all the ball or how do you get them all the reps? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, There are only so many plays on the field. We know that nine's a lot. You know, special teams going to be heavy, but you got some a couple of seniors that come in here, so you got to think those guys are expecting to play a role on the field, not on offense, not just on special teams. Anyway, my number one weakness to me is that nobody is that proven tight end entity for the herd. They may have made plays at other places, they may have stats at other places, they may have been impactful like in the run game in other places like we've talked about, but nobody really has done it in the Kelly Green yet for the herd. Toby Payne leads the way, or yeah, Toby Payne leads the way with two receptions for 27 yards and a touchdown in a herd uniform. I mean, while the potential is there for a lot of these guys, and and we're really positive about what, what we could look like, just the fact remains nobody has proven to be that absolute weapon that is there game in and game out because nobody was really tasked with being that guy last year. You have a guy like Stacy Marshall Jr. who saw a lot of playing time, Devin Miller who saw a lot of playing time, but it, 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 these guys just weren't asked to do that. So who's going to rise to the occasion? It, it, who's going to be tight end one? Who's going to be that next all-conference tight end for the herd, right? That Until we see that, like you said, it's – still a weakness just because it hasn't happened. It doesn't right. mean it necessarily is. It just is until we see it. Who's your number two? Or I don't have two? any, I don't have any other weaknesses. Well, I got a couple and I'm going to fly through them real quick. To me, it's, it's somewhat of a weakness because this is an overall younger position group, right? You've got two seniors and they're both transfers. So they're, here and gone. They haven't come up in the program and become seniors at, at Marshall and then now are leaving. Um, so it's an overall younger group. And, um, you know, we saw some some culture, some culture, some of that culture in that room graduate or leave. Right. Stacey Marshall is a one year guy, but Devin Miller was here for years, several years. So did did he do enough while he was here to pass on, you know, what we hope is uh, the vibe you want to keep in the tight end room to those youngsters. Like when you talk about your tenured guys returning being sophomores, you know, that's, that's a whole different argument. You know, you're not looking at a junior or senior who's been in the program two or three years and just knows how they do things. Yeah. These guys were last year and they know how to do things, but now they're going to be tasked to be more of a leader. So we'll see how some of these guys rise and, and, and what the vibe of this room is also new tight end coach changes the vibe a little bit. So, uh, it's not necessarily a negative, but it's it's just new. So until we see how it plays out, it's a weakness. And then lastly, this is kind of what I talked about in, in the first weakness, but who emerges as the guy? Who's the guy for tight end? Who's the defensive coordinator got to got to make sure they absolutely put a circle around and are able to nullify in this herd offense? Is it Toby Payne? Is it Salas? Is it Soto? Is it Velez? Who is it? Is it Motillo? We don't know. So who emerges as the guy or the guys from the tight end room? So really this is all based on 
what we haven't seen yet. Uh, I don't think this is a detriment to the herd offense at all. Uh, I'm really happy with what we have here and am excited to see how it plays out. But until we see some of these things, got to talk about them. Russ, let's do these big four questions, and then let's look to get the heck out of here, okay? All right. Um, most excited player to see from the wide receiver room? Mason Pierce. And uh, I, I, there's a lot of weapons and everything, but I am really excited to see him because of what I talked about before about his elusiveness in the open field. I'm most excited to see a healthy Talik Keaton. You know me mm -hmm. and those seniors. I've talked about it before, but Talik's been here forever. Um, I would love to see him be able to put a fully healthy senior campaign together and end up with an all-conference season in a, <coughs> in, a, in a conference that's full of unbelievable wideouts. Who's yeah. the biggest loss from the wide receiver standpoint from last year? I got to say Corey Gamage, even though production-wise, you know, he didn't hit the potential that I thought he, he would. He's still that six foot four, yeah. big body uh, wide receiver that everyone kind of pointed at to say that's your wide receiver one, and that's a loss. Well, he was your wide receiver one, and you're right. It is Corey Gamage for me as well. Anytime you lose your number one in receiving in, receive receptions, yards, and touchdowns, it's a loss. It's a big loss. So you have to fill all that production. He was a 500 yard receiver, you know, three. 35, 40 catches last year. It matters. It matters. Who do you think is going to be your breakout player from the wide receiver room? I'm I'm going to take Brian Robinson again, and I'm going to wait to continue to be wrong about this. I picked him last year. I'm picking him again this year. Six I'm foot, picking him. Six foot two, over 200 pounds, uh, showed a lot of good uh, receptions and yeah. uh, routes in that spring game from last year. I'm taking him again. Yeah, I'm taking him again this year, too. Or not again. I'm taking him this year, too. I don't think I did last year. I don't really remember, but I don't think it was him. I think it's his time. I think he's going to break out. You know, a year in the program, did the red shirt thing, ready to roll. You know, second year with the same coach with Bo Knight. It was Bo Knight's first year last year, Robinson's first year in last year. So the continued development of Cam Fancher and everything that we've talked about, I think this is Brian Robinson's year to to break out and put the Sun Belt on notice that we have more weapons than they're probably giving us credit for in Huntington, West Virginia. When it's all said and done, who you think's the MVP from a wide receiver standpoint? <sighs> this is my toughest one, and I'm gonna pick Brian Robinson because I feel like that's the breakout that he is capable of having. Uh, Charles Montgomery, Talik Keaton uh, could definitely be a, a close 1A for, for this, but I'm taking Robinson. I'm going Charles Montgomery, and that was the quickest one for me, honestly, because I looked at last year and I thought, man, this guy was <laughs> – you know, thrust into action, and and just as the season went along, he proved that he belonged on that field and was able to make play after play after play. So give me Charles Montgomery. I think when it's all said and done, he's going to lead the team in receptions, yards, and touchdowns. I think he's going to step in and fill the void for Corey Gamage from an inside receiver who is replacing – the production from an outside receiver. I think that's an, a, an amazing storyline that I, I am excited to keep track of. I just love what Charles Montgomery does. Russ, let's move to tight ends real quick. Who are you most excited to see in 2023 from the tight end room? <sighs> Sean Salas. And I was that was last year for me as well. Uh, but that size, that matchup nightmare, six foot five in uh, 230 pounds, but having that speed, it, it's just like having a big wide receiver out there. But he's obviously played tight end forever, and uh, that that's who I'm looking forward to. It could easily be some of these other guys for that as well. There's a lot of newcomers here, but I'm going with Salas. Well, the edge for me went to Toby Payne because we saw him in 10 games last year. Salas is coming off of an injury, so you know there's there's nothing to compare to, right? And we saw flashes. We saw that uh, you know Toby can go get the ball. He can make some moves. He's really hard to bring down. Like all of these things just make me excited to see him in in 2023. And Look, I can't sit here and say I'm not stoked to see the Payne brothers on the field at the yeah. same time. You know, the 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 local guys. I mean, come on, man. If you're not stoked to see that th sort of thing, Herd fans were excited when the Fronapple brothers were on the field together. So while not the same thing, it's not a quarterback tight end, it's a running back tight end. How are you not going to love a couple of all-state 
high school uh, first team all state players from the state of West Virginia coming to play for the herd on the field at the same time. We saw it a little bit last year. He's just who I'm most excited to see, I think, in 2023. Who's the biggest loss for you from a year ago? Devin Miller. Nothing else to say. I yeah, mean, look at look at the production. Look at the time that he's had here. Well, it, it is Devin Miller, and it's and it's not just the the sexy touchdown from Notre Dame. It's remember the third and ten that yeah. kept that drive alive. It's the fact that he was so fundamentally sound in every aspect of the game. And oh, by the way, he came back from a ridiculous injury the year oh, before yeah. against yeah. North Texas. How are you not going to cheer for a guy like that? Yeah. You know, we rooted for him to have a bounce back year. And while the stat line didn't blow you away, the opportunities really, the offense wasn't really focused on the tight end last year in a big way. But when he had opportunities, boy, did he make them count. I mean, keeping a historic drive alive early and then capping it off with the touchdown, the biggest loss is easily Devin Miller. Who's your breakout guy for 2023? I'm going with Salas. Uh, I mean, he, again, I think that it's that matchup outside uh now i don't think that it's uh unheard of to have a six foot five speedy tight end you know it, that's not where i'm getting at but i just think that he is that much of an athlete out there that he is going to be able to do some really good things uh on the football field for us so that's who i'm going with yeah me too he's my breakout player i like the potential i love the potential that we thought we were going to see last year you know we were really excited about what he brought to the field and and we just never got to see it because he got a little dinged up and you know to 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 have that possibility in front of us again and and you think about wow what would a Toby Payne Sean Salas you know two tight end set look like with Rasheen back there and a couple of wide outs and what what gets moving all around in the heads of our offensive coordinator when you have that type of athleticism, size, and flexibility across your offense, and and oh by the way, you've got a quarterback that can either drop back and pass it, or he can take off with it. Yeah, the the, the options are pretty much limitless to a degree. So give me Sean Salas as my breakout player too. When it's all said and done, who do you think is your MVP for the tight end unit? Going with Salas again. <laughs> well, I'm gonna I'm gonna. This is my biggest cop out so far from a receiving standpoint i think it's going to be toby Payne, right because he's been there done that and played 10 games for the herd last year but also in addition to that i think the guys who are the bona fide run blockers are really going to be an mvp for this unit that is going to be often not talked about unless it's by us but man those guys are going to be equally, if not a little bit more so important to our overall team success in 2023. Russ, dang, what an awesome breakdown. Man, that was a lot of info. I hope you guys uh, in, enjoyed that. But um, we had I, – I mean, obviously we didn't talk about this much stuff with any other position group, but whew, this was a great breakdown, chock full of information and, and really good takes, I feel like. This wasn't something that was uh, – just kind of hot takey. You know, this was really good info. You brought some good points. I hope I brought some good points. And I hope folks now feel like they've got a better idea of what our wide receivers and tight ends are looking like in 2023. Um, Russ, look, let, let's give me some final words before you take us all the way out. If you've got final words, let me have them. But I've got one thing to say at the very end before you take us out. You just go ahead with that. All right. Well, I would be remiss if I did not tell uh, my wife that uh, I love her very much because this week we're celebrating our 13th wedding anniversary and uh, she should be listening. But, you know, you never really know. She's the sucker for those murder mystery podcasts, as are, I guess, most women in the world. But um, I just wanted to say to Jennifer that I love you very much. A happy anniversary. It has been the quickest 13 years uh, that of my life and it's been so great every even the hard times weren't that bad we've had far more great times than hard times we're closing in on nearly 20 years together russ and yeah we dated for a long time but um i know i made the right choice when i married my wife and um i certainly outkicked my coverage on july 10th of 2010 so i just wanted to say that I love her very much, and she has been bugging me for years, dude, to get on this podcast, and I'm always like, nah, I don't know about that. But tell me, tell you what, 
if you're watching on YouTube, get down in the comments and let me know if you would like to see my wife in some capacity on this podcast or just listen to her or something. Because honestly, there's a part of me that goes, I wonder how this might go. But anyway, uh, take us out of here. All right. Whether you see us at the cam, whether you see us at the Joan, or whether you see us celebrating 13 wonderful years with KD and Mrs. KD, no matter <laughs> Where you see us, we're going to be saying, go Hurt. Go Hurt. It's the Thundercast. Hey, come back next week as the Breakdown Series continues, and we're going to be talking about the Herd linebacking core. We'll see you next week. Later. Later.